Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to introduce our next speaker. Many of you already know Charin, whether it's from his papers, which have been cited now 30,000 times, or maybe you know him through his track record of mentorship, as many of us here in the room, myself included, have been lucky to have had him as our champion. Or maybe you actually know him from his rock star ambitions as part of the infamous Pavlov's Dogs. But however you know him, you know that Charin is not afraid to speak his mind. And when he speaks, I think you should probably pay attention because he's been ahead of the curve of memory research for the past 20 years. One of his first big, big papers made waves for blurring the boundaries between different kinds of memory processes, showing that the hippocampus is not just for long-term memory, but it's sometimes involved in maintaining novel information and working memory as well. His most cited empirical paper, which was now published 20 years ago as of this year, provided some of the first evidence that human medial temporal lobe subregions play distinct roles in memory, and this has helped to provide a foundation for the dominant model of regional specialization within the medial temporal lobes. Um, when he talks about this paper, he also likes to remind people that it was published in Neuropsychologia instead of some CLAM journal. Um, although, to be fair, he also has, I think, more than his fair share of neuron papers as well. Um, more recently, Charin has been advocating for yet another shift in the way that we talk about the role of the hippocampus, arguing that instead of the hippocampus being some pinnacle of its very own memory system, we should think of it as serving to interconnect dissociable cortical networks that are involved in representing different aspects of experience, whether this is in the service of episodic memory or across a variety of cognitive domains. So over my years of working with Charin, I have learned that he has a remarkable gift for sing seeing signal in the noise, for finding clarity in what seems to be a mess of data. He has a knack for synthesizing data across experimental approaches, cognitive domains, and even species. And it's this ability that makes him an insightful speaker and certainly a never boring speaker. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what paradigm shift he has in store for us today. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Charan Ranganath. I would have gone for punk rock, but I'll take that. I will take that anymore. Um, so I, I just want to say, first of all, I'm just very touched by your uh, speech, Maureen, and it's just such a great thing. Even It's, be, it's fantastic being uh, invited to give a talk like this, even more fantastic when you get one of your star trainees to give the speech that introduces you. So uh, this is just, I've been very nervous about this. Uh, I know many of these kinds of conferences, you get the white folks speaking, and so I want to make sure that I get a chance to represent and, you know, hopefully not get blacklisted for future things. And I, I'm really actually, in all seriousness, that was a horrible joke, but in all seriousness, I just want to, uh, you know, thank, first of all, Mike and Manuela for uh, doing such a great job uh, with this conference. It's just been an amazing list of speakers. I'm very honored to be among them. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and uh, I'm sorry about this very pretentious title, um, and that's been putting a lot of pressure. I've written and erased about five talks in the past few days. Um, uh, but before I actually get into the talk, I just want to give a shameless plug to, uh, for many of the work that we have going on uh, at the meeting. Um, and uh, we've, uh, you've already had a chance maybe to see a couple of them, but we have a bunch more on Saturday and Sunday, so I really hope you get a chance to see those. Um, so, okay, what am I talking about with the paradigm shift here? I'm not gonna try to give you a story about how we've answered everything. I really actually want to inspire people to think about questions more than answers. And, uh, you know, so we've all heard about the stability plasticity dilemma, right? When do you hold on to something, a memory that you formed, whether it's a personal one or a collective memory, versus when do you update or when do you just replace it all together, right? And in science, we have this problem all the time. Thomas Kuhn defined a paradigm as basically the structure of the assumptions and the approaches that we take in science, the way we look at the problem as well as the way we try to solve it. And under his philosophical framework, 
you don't make scientific progress unless you have a paradigm that you're working in. And so scientific progress involves a set of assumptions and approaches that constrain the questions you ask and the answers that you can get. And he said a paradigm shift is necessary at moments when you can't necessarily, oh geez, I've already destroyed something. Uh, <laughs> so a paradigm shift is necessary when um, we uh, have stuff that we cannot necessarily accommodate. And I'm not gonna tell you all that you have a paradigm shift, I'm just gonna talk about my own change and my own thinking. And hopefully this might uh, interface with you. So what is memory in the first place, right? I mean, this is kind of a dumb question to ask here. But uh, at least in humans, the study of memory goes back at least to Ebbinghaus uh, in 1885. And Ebbinghaus was a subject in his own experiments. And he memorized these meaningless vowel cons consonant, vowel, consonant trigrams, like what I'm showing you. I don't know if I can actually show it. It's weird to point from there, but like those. Right? And so we all know about Ebbinghaus's famous forgetting curve, which is actually pretty dire if you think about it, right? So it's like there's about a massive loss, 60% loss, using the most generous ways of defining memory you could think of, in about an hour, right? So this is just mind-boggling to think that you'll lose at least 60% of my talk within one hour. And uh, so it's sad. Hopefully you won't remember the bad jokes that failed. Um, but the thing that I'd like you to point out is, is that Ebbinghaus was the best subject he could possibly get. He was a professional subject, and yet he struggled. So Ebbinghaus, if you actually read his treatise, he said he could only memorize up to 20, 64 trigrams because towards the end of the time he had exhaustion, headache, and other symptoms were felt. Now that is somebody who really sacrificed himself for science, and it really gives you the sense that our memory is a struggle, right? And I spent years doing list learning paradigms with pictures and words and objects and trying to force people, squeeze blood from a stone to get something from the hippocampus to tell us that memory is happening. And we did, and we went pretty far with it, right? But this is the thing that's always bugged me. Memory in the real world doesn't necessarily resemble what we do in the lab. And so to illustrate this, I want to, uh, want to show you an example of LeBron James, who's the NBA all-time scoring record. And here he's going to be uh, talking about his memory for a basketball game that he played in. The start of the fourth, I think they cut it to 14. Um, do you have any idea what, I mean, I think they scored seven quick ones. Anything, what happened there? What happened? Um, we ran them, the first possession, we ran them down all the way. The two on the shot clock, Marcus Morris missed a jump shot, followed it up, he got it, they got a dunk. Uh, we came back down, we ran a set for Jordan Crawford, I mean Jordan Clarkson, and he came off and missed it. They rebounded it. Um, and we came back on the defensive end and we got a stop. They took it out on the sideline. Jason Tatum took the ball out, threw it to Marcus Smart in the short corner, he made a three. We come back down, missed another shot, and then um, Tatum came down and went 94 feet, did a real step, and made a right-hand layup timeout. <laughs> All right. There you go. Last there you go, exactly. So, I don't know about you, but when I play basketball, I can barely think about anything. And if you're playing an NBA basketball game, you have so much going on. Think about that blast of information. And he's encoding an event over the course of, events over the course of 45 minutes. Now, to me, this just underscores the enormity of the task that we have as memory researchers to try to explain how he can take this massive amount of information over 45 minutes and compress it into a story that captures all the relevant details in the order that they happened in a way that's communicable and understandable to the general public, right? That is what we really need to explain. And so this has been something that I've been struggling with a lot. Um, now in physics they say, in astrophysics they say something like 95% of matter in the universe is actually unobservable by current instruments. So we can conclude for that that either physicists suck or, which probably, maybe, I don't know, I'll leave you to decide on that, depending on how many physicists there are in the audience that have offended. But um, the other conclusion that you can take from this is that maybe we should be a little worried about things that we might be missing, things that we might not be seeing. What's the dark matter in memory that we might be missing? And so this is something that has been 
on my mind for a long time. And so we've made some shifts in our research to try to get at the bigger picture of memory. So one thing we've been doing is moving out from individual regions to conceptualizing memory as a network phenomenon. Another thing that we've been doing is we've been moving away from micro-level studies of memory to looking at memory for stru uh, structured events. And finally, something I won't really have time to talk about, it was in one of the talks I threw away, is that uh, computational models as a bridge between brain and behavior. I really would love to talk more about that, but I think Craig Stark is gonna start squawking at me if I go over on time, so. Um, oh, this is a tough audience. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so let's go to the first bit. Memory is a network phenomenon. So when I started off, we really thought about memory in terms of a system that involved the hippocampus and really mainly a few neocortical areas, the entorhinal cortex is transitional and the perirhinal and the parahippocampal cortex. And uh, a lot of our work, you know, what got me tenure was thinking about dissecting this memory circuit and coming up with different functions for different regions in the circuit and being able to then add on the role of prefrontal cortex as controlling the memory processes that we get uh, from the medial temporal lobes. And so I was at a memory conference around the time that 2010 paper came out. I felt like we had all figured it out and it was just a matter of time before everyone else would be convinced. And I saw a lot of stuff on the default network. And I really hated the default network up till that point. But then I realized, wait, no, it's about memory. And so I got turned on to a whole lot of work. So people using functional connectivity, looking at correlations and bold signal between uh, the hippocampus and other parts of the brain, what you find is, is that it's not everywhere that shows high connectivity with the hippocampus. It's a set of regions that corresponds to the default network, which was a set of areas identified as being essentially showing deactivation during boring attention tests, basically. But if you do a memory test, they light up like a Christmas tree. And in fact, this is actually data from one of Maureen's studies here. Uh, and we had actually seen this in a study looking at functional connectivity with the hippocampus, specifically when people successfully encode memories. And I didn't even see it at the time. It was just invisible to me because it wasn't in my paradigm. And now people have shown that, in fact, amnesia is associated with massive disconnection of the default network. And so this is, not, this is going beyond saying that this network is just around. It seems to be playing a critical role in memory. And uh, I just want to highlight uh, this, uh, the symposium that Zach Ray has organized on this topic later this afternoon. So uh, one of the other things that really struck me was a few talks that I saw on semantic dementia. And one of the things that I never realized about semantic dementia, which is an age-related neurodegenerative disease, it's a variant of frontotemporal dementia that's associated with a loss of semantic knowledge about, especially about objects. And one of the interesting things is, is that semantic dementia is associated with damage to the hippocampus. And so is Alzheimer's disease. And what I'm showing you here is actually data from, not my lab, but uh, uh, showing essentially areas of atrophy in Alzheimer's disease at the top and semantic dementia at the bottom. And then the common areas of atrophy in both. And what you can see is the atrophy in both is in the hippocampus. And yet, Alzheimer's in the earliest stages is associated with episodic memory dysfunction, and semantic dementia in its earliest stages is associated with semantic dysfunction. So there seems to be something about these different components of the default network that seem to be associated with different ways of expressing memory. And that's really one of the things that got me to shift my paradigm. So uh, this is actually a study that was way ahead of its time by Maureen Ritchie, actually. And she was using methods that were so unusual that, in fact, I think we got a lot of flack from reviewers for it. We really went through a lot of rounds of revisions on it. Uh, but basically what Maureen did was she took some data that we had actually uh, run other studies looking at functional connectivity of areas in the medial temporal lobe. And what Maureen did is she used those regions as targets in a new study and said, what areas show correlated fluctuations in bold signal with uh, each other, right? This is a, uh, using a technique called community detection. And basically, she was able to break up these regions that show functional connectivity at the MTL into three different modules. And this is what's shown here with these squares. I can't really see them, but uh, hopefully you can. Um, 
And then what she did was during a memory task, when people weren't doing, asked to do any kind of, they were actually doing a memory task in an independent data set, and were not even looking at functional connectivity. And what she showed was that areas that were in the same connectivity module were actually activating in a similar way across the different conditions in our experiments. She also showed that if you use activity pattern analysis techniques, which are very new in the memory field at that time, and you just ask what information is represented by these different regions, what you found was that regions that were in a similar functional connectivity module also showed similar profiles of representational similarity. In other words, these representations were not localized necessarily to one region, but they seem to be shared and distributed across different subnetworks of the DMN. And so this, to me, was just mind-blowing and really changed my paradigm for thinking about things. And it, I'm really impressed when you see data like this, because in human research, you know, we don't necessarily have uh, the optogenetics or anything that can give you these unambiguous results. And so here is just showing that every one of our subjects showed higher correlations in activation profiles and representational similarity for areas that were within the same network than for areas that are in different networks. So this is unequivocal evidence for some kind of sharing of function. And so what we started to do then was really think about maybe we should zoom out our unit of analysis and not focus on regions so much as subnetworks. So Maureen and I came up with a framework where we uh, theorized that two of these subcomponents, which we call the posterior medial network, which is blue, and the anterior temporal network, shown in red, uh, correspond to different aspects of events. They're encoding information about people and things on one hand, that's in red, and uh, places and situations uh, in the PM network, which is shown in blue. Since then, uh, my uh, former postdoc, Alex Barnett, now at the U of T, uh, has done uh, even more detailed connectivity analyses, and actually we've been able to break up the default network and separate it from medial temporal regions. And essentially, uh, the story gets more complicated, as it always does, but we were able to replicate the idea that there's an anterior and posterior uh, networks, but we also found a differentiation between the medial prefrontal network and a network that we call the medial temporal network, which includes areas like the parahippocampal cortex. Um, we do a word cloud, let's say, just on studies that have been published in the imaging literature. And what you can see is that despite the fact that these areas actually do show quite a bit of functional connectivity relationships in common, there's fairly distinct uh, descriptors of the, uh, what these areas are doing. Some are more autobiographical and episodic, some are more spatial, some are more in terms of valuation, for instance, some are in more in terms of people and their characteristics. So we wanted to test this idea, but to test this idea, we had to change our way of thinking about how memory is going to be tested in the first place. We had to change the paradigm again. So, uh, but we didn't have to start from scratch. Actually, Frederick Bartlett was one of the first uh, people to really explore how people remember complex events. And so Bartlett didn't give people, actually if you read Bartlett, it's just fascinating. His first sentence just excoriates Ebbinghaus. He has no statistics in this thing. It's just crazy, really. Uh, but one of the things that he said, which is still mind-blowing to this day, is he said, remembering is not the re-excitation of innumerable fixed lifeless or fragmentary traces, i.e. engrams. Uh, that's not no diss on the engram people, it's just the idea of the engram I'm dissing. Uh, but he said it's an imaginative reconstruction. And what he meant by that is that we don't replay the past, we imagine how the past could have been. And that to me is still mind blowing today as it was then. Uh, but you know, my, even though I worked with my uh, um, Marsha Johnson as a postdoc, who really took on this question of how do we even tell the difference between memory and imagination? And the truth is we often can't. And Beth Loftus, who uh, is actually here at UC Irvine, did fantastic work showing our failures to differentiate between memory and imagination. Uh, and so one of the things that we all know now is that if you scan people while they remember real life events, like autobiographical memory tests, you see activation all through the default network. But you also see activation all through the default network when people construct possible events that never actually occurred. 
And so, again, this suggests the idea that the default network may be involved in not necessarily replaying the past, but constructing, reconstructing the past. Now, we've been fortunate to work on the shoulders of a lot of people who took very big risks in developing naturalistic controlled research to look at memories for structured events. And um, there's many people here, there's many others, I'm sure I'm leaving out, I'm sorry for that. But I really do want to acknowledge the work of Janice Chen because Janice did a study that was just mind-boggling where she shows people a movie. This is like an episode of uh, Sherlock, which is, I think it's like about an hour long or something like that. And what she found was that areas in the default network would hold an activity pattern. So this would be essentially some kind of mental representation that was specific for an event that could last about 40 seconds, which in a neuron's world is a lifetime, basically, right? I mean, 40 seconds is just not something I thought we could actually even look at. And so this really gave us a chance to exploit the crappiness of fMRI because we can look at slow things really well. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to think about is how can we go farther than just saying that we have event representations? Well, one of the things that we know is, is that we reuse a lot of information across events. So this is just an illustration I show in some of my talks about how many different uh, movies, for instance, can be reduced into what uh, the um, folklorist Joseph Campbell called the hero's journey, where there's essentially a series of steps that a hero gets to in order to save the universe. I won't go into it in detail, but basically you can take many, many, many epic movies, whether they're animated films for kids or action movies for adults, and find that they all follow the same arc, the same trajectory. We have structure for events in our minds, and so we're never really starting from scratch when we form a memory. An adult with knowledge of the world, or a wild-type rat, or a dolphin, anything else in the real world is forming memories with a framework and a scaffold that it already has. There are no new memories per se, there's just recombinations of existing ones. Now, this idea is actually motivated in a number of different ways. So if you go back to the complementary learning systems framework of McClellan, McNaughton, and O'Reilly, they make this point that essentially the neocortex is all about encoding structure. And in fact, in neural network models, what you find is, is that neural networks are great for getting structure. This is why ChatGPT4 works as well as it does. But what they don't do so well, and this is why ChatGPT4 requires so much training data, is getting exceptions to the rules, the things that don't make sense under the current paradigm, so to speak. And that's where you need the hippocampus. And so I've been fortunate enough to team up with a super team of people who I've been learning from, uh, including Jeff Zacks, who will be speaking relatively soonish, uh, uh, to develop a computational framework to understand how the hippocampus and the neocortex might be working together to construct and reconstruct events. And so we call this the structured event memory model. And basically, in this model, we talk about this distinction between you know, event structure, the particulars that of a particular event that might be going on, the details, the content, so to speak. And we talk about how you use schemas to sort of construct these memories and how hippocampus may be taking snapshots of individual moments that could be filling in the blanks. So, uh, one of the coolest studies that I have to talk about is one that was done by uh, Zach Rayo when he was in my lab. And so, uh, Zach Ray, sorry, I keep doing this. Yeah. Anyway, so Zach uh, came up with a very cool study where he took videos of people in various places. And so this is a video of two people uh, who were in the lab at the time, actually, Kamina and Alex. And they're both in a cafe doing very cafe-like activities. And we have... Uh, uh, and we had, uh, so here's Kameen on the top and here's Alex on the bottom. For some reason, he called them Tommy and Lisa. He also had videos. This is the one everyone laughs at. I, I should just stop telling jokes, just give my talk. Uh, so, um, uh, so this is uh, two videos that he made of them in two different grocery stores. And so the reason that this study was so interesting was not because the movies were particularly vivid or rich. I mean, you know, Zach's more of a scientist than a screenwriter. But nonetheless, he did something very cool scientifically, which was to divide up these movies so that they all shared one component. Some movies shared a context, like where they were at. Some movies shared a particular person. 
And some movies shared a situation, like being in a cafe or being in a grocery store, regardless of where it actually took place. And so this allowed us to see, are there shared components of memories that we can pull apart? And so Zach showed these film clips to people in the scanner, 40 second videos, three times in a row, and we just averaged those activity patterns and looked at the similarity across the different repetitions. And so what I'm showing you here, and I'm sorry, I really would love to go this, into this in detail, but this is basically how similar each of these movies would look if essentially uh, they were just representing information about context, if context were the only thing that was being represented. And this is what we see all over the posterior medial network. So I rarely show raw RS matrices because they usually look like junk, but this is just, you don't need statistics. You could use your eyeballs here. That's what it looks like. And you notice the diagonal is not hot. And what that means is that we're not seeing any evidence that the actual movie itself is being represented. It's the context. And when we look at the medial prefrontal cortex, it's just a revelation because this is what it would look like if it just cared if you're in a cafe or a supermarket. And boom, that's what we get. So medial prefrontal cortex is really not caring about what you're seeing beyond what the situation is. And finally, in the anterior temporal network, we get a representation that's much more about who's in the video than where it is or what was happening, okay? Oh, sorry. And so when Zach looked at when people are recalling these movies, or just looking at a blank screen and recalling the movies, what you see is that the patterns that we see when we repeat the movies are equally evoked when people are recalling these movies. So again, this is just raw data, basically. But you can see here, it's, it's a little messier. But the PM network is just representing the context information when people are recalling the movie. When, uh, and the P MPFC is representing the situation, and the AT network is representing information about the people. So what we're seeing is that the neocortex seems to be capable of doing the heavy lifting in our memories, reconstructing events by recombining different components. So what about the hippocampus? And again, this is where changing the paradigm can be really useful, because what we see in the hippocampus is completely different. So a lot of the event cognition literature, people don't actually report hippocampal data. And the reason is, is that the hippocampus, you'd think from play cell data that the hippocampus should be encoding memories constantly, or the subsequent memory effect literature, hippocampus should be encoding and retrieving constantly. And in fact, that's just not what you see in the data. Now we do see in our data that the hippocampus does encode these event-specific uh, activity patterns, meaning that if you look along the diagonal, you can see this kind of hot spot there, meaning that there's something about each event that's unique. And we do see that those activity patterns, when people recall the event, the more you reinstate them, the better their memory is. So, so far, this is very good for the hippocampus does episodic memory story. But here's where the problems come in. So, basically, if you go back and you do the uh, 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 pattern similarity approach that I talked about before, but now you break it up in time and you separate the beginning, the middle, and the end. What Zach finds is, is that the hippocampus shows a reliable representation of the beginning and the end, but not the middle. And you might say, well, uh, who cares about the middle? It just sucks, right? But no, that's not really true. Most of the brain actually cares about the middle. So if we look in the AT and the PM network, if anything, we get overrepresentation of the middle of the event. So what this is telling us is that the hippocampus is doing something mysterious and different, and it's just grabbing these weird points at the beginning and the end. What's going on with that? So there's actually a whole load of data out there that we all tend to know about but overlook that actually speaks to this issue. So there's a great paper by De Curtis and Pere. It's just like perfect band name, too. It's a wall of inhibition. And in this paper, what they talk about is this idea that in fact, if you actually look at the neurophysiological characteristics of the perirhinal cortex and the enterhinal cortex, which is thought to be the master hub getting into the hippocampus, it's by and large not wanting to pass information to the hippocampus. And you really have to have some kind of a salient signal to pass information through. They actually argue that, in fact, in most times, it's actually you're not getting information to the hippocampus. Great paper from uh, many people in this room, I'm sure, uh, on the nucleus reunions, which is a medial, uh, which is a thalamic nucleus that interfaces between the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. Talks about how 
the nucleus reunions plays a role in gating information processing in the hippocampus. So we should think about the hippocampus like a resource. And in fact, uh, I don't have it here, but uh, Kyu Hong Lu and Ken Norman at uh, Princeton have done some great modeling on this topic. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge Menno Witter's beautiful work neuroanatomically looking at layer two of the entorhinal cortex. And a lot of that stuff has been, uh, you know, people have interpreted these things in terms of grid cells and so forth. But the main point of his work is you have principal cells that talk to each other through interneurons. Massive degree of inhibition. The brain doesn't want to get stuff into the hippocampus, I would argue. And in fact, those moments when we do are going to be kind of important. This is kind of a silly thing. I'm doing this more for the app challenge, actually. Uh, but we can go back to Pavlov, uh, of Pavlov's dog's fame. Uh, and Pavlov, actually, if you go back to his initial lectures, he has this great section where he talks about something called the what is it response. It's a response that any animal will get when something violates the context that's been going on previously. Uh, we now have become much more boring. We call it the orienting response, but I like the what is it response. And in fact, if you look neurophysiologically, you see neuromodulatory responses when context change. You see hippocampal activity, like the P300 ERP, for instance, in the hippocampus when uh, context change. And uh, what Bob Knight has shown is that frontal and hippocampal lesions actually delete that P300 response. So, and in fact, this is actually one of the coolest things I'm going to show you uh, that's not from our lab anyway, is that uh, um, this was a study done by Thomas Grunwald, an epileptologist, and they were using the P300, the response to surprising events, as a means of diagnosing whether a uh, hippocampus was sclerotic. What he found was it was a wonderful, far better than memory, actually, uh, way of diagnosing whether a hippocampus is functioning. And he found this gorgeous correlation between the number of dentate granule cells in a resected hippocampus and the amount of P300 that you could record from it. I mean, this is what the hippocampus really wants to do, is respond to these like novel things. And just because I have a soft spot for Peter Cook and sea lions, I'll just say that uh, this has even been used, orienting has been used as an assay for domoic acid poisoning in sea lions as well. It's very, very useful uh, in understanding hippocampal function. And so Nikolai Oxmacher, who is then an up-and-coming uh, neurologist, uh, did some great intracranial work showing that, in fact, when you give people surprising information, what you find is, is this intracranial P300 is predictive of memory for unexpected information. Not so much for expected information, but really for unexpected information. Uh, we've replicated this in an unpublished fMRI study, thanks for viewer B. Um, uh, but nonetheless, we did replicate this finding with fMRI, and we found all sorts of other stuff, including VTA activation, ask me about that later. Um, but this all brings me to a, a point that I'm probably going to have to um, uh, run through quickly, which is event boundaries, right? So, so far we've talked about the surprising things, and events are full of surprises actually, right? But they're also, they're surprising because we can build up a context that's based on our prior knowledge. So if I just showed you this picture right here, you already have an engram for this memory that hasn't even happened yet. You already have an engram for this, because essentially, you know that Homer's in a chef's hat, and so he's about to make breakfast. And so that's your mental model going in. But then when the breakfast catches on fire, if you haven't seen me give this talk before, you'll realize that there is, in fact, something wrong. Now your model has to change. And so as a result, you say that the making breakfast event is over, and the fire event has started. And what's crucial here is, is that really, if you want to form new memories, you have to use the surprising information. That's what you need. You don't necessarily need to know that wearing a chef's hat is about making breakfast. You need to learn that Homer sets fires when he makes breakfast, right? And so event boundaries are actually pretty crucial for understanding episodic memory. And so a bunch of work has been done showing it's now one of the most reliable replicated findings around that the hippocampus lights up at event boundaries. What I'm showing you here is data from Alex Barnett. This is a histogram of people who weren't scanned, just saying, watching a movie, that Alex made an animated film and just pushing a button where one event ended and the next event began. And so what you'll see is that there's some points in time where most of the subjects, not all, ah, damn it, I spoiled it. Um, <laughs> most of the subjects agree that there's a shift between one event and the next. And so this is parahippocampal cortex activity laid on top of that. 
And what you see is it's just beautifully coincident. In people who are scanned but not asked to segment the events, the spikes in parapocampal activity beautifully correspond to when other people who weren't even, watch, who weren't even scanned tell you that there's an event boundary. Um, Zach Ray did this with 546 subjects, data, no replication crisis here, replicates the findings, hippocampus lights up at event boundaries, so does the posterior medial network. But not all of the brain does. In fact, a lot of the brain doesn't like event boundaries, and so including the anterior temporal network, actually. Um, in case you are a snob about fMRI, what I could say is, is that uh, Zach has some unpublished data with Angelique De La Raza showing that you can get these effects with high res in hippocampal subfields. And actually, for those of you who think fMRI is useless, well, look at your single unit data, basically. So this is a sequence of hippocampal cells that fired from David Tank's study uh, during three different stages of a task. And I'll just keep this very simple. If you actually look at this, what you can see is the majority of these cells, which I've sort of highlighted in red, fire at the beginning of one event, at the end of the event. Fewer cells are firing actually in related to the sequence in between. So this is there, we just have to look for it, okay? Um, Aya Benyakov did this study that made me really, I, I didn't know how to encode it because it didn't fit with my paradigm, so I dumped it in the back of my mind, where she showed that when you show people movies in the scanner, you find activation after the movie is over that predicts successful memory encoding. But this is actually now a widely replicated finding that you don't even have to end the movie, you can just end the event. And so many people, this is again data from Alex, show that um, activation at the event boundary, a shift between, let's say, two scenes in a movie, predicts whether or not you will successfully encode that memory. And this is just data showing in individual subjects, almost all of them showed more event boundary activation for um, events that were remembered in the movie relative to events that were forgotten. Um, and this is just really cool data showing that uh, Alex has this under revision right now, showing that if you look at functional connectivity between the posterior medial network and the hipp hippocampus, so correlations in activity, when those correlations are high at the event boundary, it's predictive of successful memory of the event that happened right before the event boundary. But when those correlations are high in the middle of the event, it's negatively correlated with memory. So it's not just about having communication between the hippocampus and the PMN, but when that communication happens, because what's the most important information that you need to encode? Uh, I don't have time to get into it, but there's so much I could tell you about event boundaries. You find stuff with intracranial EEG. There's all sorts of interesting cognitive things that happen at event boundaries. Jeff will maybe tell you more about it, although he kind of sounds like he might not. But anyway, um, but let's go back to LeBron James, right? So. Um, this is actually a quote. So LeBron says that he has a photographic memory, but many of us don't believe in a photographic memory, right? Uh, but what I love is this quote from former Cal basketball star Jason Kidd, who really talks about LeBron's basketball IQ. And he says that LeBron plays the game in a way, in the sense of anticipating what's next. And likewise, LeBron himself says, I literally close my eyes and know where my guys are gonna be at. So, it's not about actually remembering what's happening or forming memories of what's happening at the time, but having such a deep understanding of the game that you already have that memory. And in fact, this is actually uh, data from James Antony. This wasn't done in my lab, uh, but uh, James basically scanned people while they watched basketball games. And what he found was is that areas like the medial prefrontal cortex, and you can see this in the posterior medial network too, show correlated pattern, stable patterns of activity, it's hard to see here, um, but stable patterns of activity within different events in the game that reflect people's beliefs about what's happening in the game at that moment. And what he found in some unpublished analyses that I talked him into doing was the posterior hippocampus, and anterior, but especially posterior, shows spikes in activity at these uh, moments between possessions, when the ball changes uh, possession between the two teams, that predicts memory for that previous possession. So point number two is, we think that the hippocampus is specially specialized to encode information that cannot be derived by the neocortex. It's giving you something that you didn't already have. And so if I have any time left, I'm just gonna very quickly go into how we're looking at this in relation to cognitive aging. 
Uh, so this is data from Zach uh, that's published and also from Angelique and Zach uh, in a poster that they're going to be presenting here. And basically, uh, in this study, they looked at uh, event boundary activation across 546 people ranging in age from, I don't know, 18 to 80. And what they found was huge correlation between age, a negative correlation, and activation at event boundaries during a movie. And so this is just, if you break it up into three groups, what you could see is old, young and middle-aged people, lots of PM network activation, but then older adults, it goes way down, right? And when you actually look at event representation in the, uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, this is the medial temporal network, but uh, anyway, uh, if you look at event representation, what you see is, in fact, younger people show more event representation than older adults in this network, meaning that if you just take a pattern of activity during the event and a pattern of activity during recall, that pattern correlation is higher in older adults than in younger adults. Now, on the other hand, if you look at event boundary activation in the medial prefrontal network, what you find is the opposite, actually. As you get older, you get more activation at event boundaries in the medial prefrontal cortex. Lots and lots of activation, actually. And for whatever reason, we're see they're seeing more encoding recall reinstatement, meaning more fidelity of the encoding-related patterns in older adults than in younger adults in the medial prefrontal network. And finally, this actually fits with what we know about functional connectivity, because we found that the posterior hippocampus shows higher functional connectivity with the medial temporal network and the anterior more with the medial prefrontal network. And what we find is, is that age-related changes in event boundary activation are dramatic in the posterior hippocampus, and they're quite mellow in the anterior hippocampus, not even significant. And this is just another way of depicting this data. It's not that there's no response, it's just a smaller response, but the posterior hippocampus, which is interestingly also where the P300 tends to be biggest in the dentate and CA1, um, is actually seems to be where the action is for event segmentation. So I hope this hasn't been completely incongruous uh, and punctuated by moments of bad humor. But what I'm hoping to illustrate to you is not necessarily that we've solved this problem. I have no idea what's going on in the age. I can tell you all sorts of ideas that we have, but no one idea that I'm convinced about. But what I will say is, is that, you know, we can go bigger. It's okay. We, can, we have the tools. We have the methods. And I'm not saying that this is anything fancy. I mean, this is just a starting point. But we should really do more. We can go beyond saying the hippocampus has to do everything. No, it doesn't. Give the hippocampus a break. We can think about networks and how networks work together. And in fact, our modeling suggests that in fact, we can't even really interpret what's going on in the hippocampus unless we know what's going on in the prefrontal cortex, unless we know what's going on in the entorhinal cortex, unless we know what's going on in the posterior medial network. And that's where modeling can come in really handy. Rather than saying recollection and familiarity, episodic and semantic, these models can help us capture principles that help us bridge these different gaps. And finally, I think we can go from micro-level paradigms in people that don't understand the structure of what's going on or in animals that have never been outside of a box in the lab who are wandering around chasing food pellets to things that resemble how animals remember in the real world based on the knowledge that they have about the real world. So with that, I will close and thank everyone for your attention through this rambling talk. <laughs>